Hi, this is Rick from For Community, creating community spaces so you can connect with others and also with God. There's a guy that I have been friends with since I was 16. We've moved far away, then we've moved close, then we've moved far away again. We've had kids. We don't talk every week. Sometimes we only talk once a year. But between 16 and now, we have remained friends. And as far as I can tell, nothing's going to change that. I mean, we've changed. We've changed a lot. We were young, and now we're old. We have changed. But for some reason, the friendship has endured. What about you? Who is one of your longest standing friends? If you're watching with someone, please pause the video and try to come up with some reasons why you think the friendship has endured through all of your changes in life so that you can still call yourselves friends today. This video is based on my interpretation of Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 to 33. Don't worry, I'm not going to read the whole text in this video. I'm just going to sum it up a bit. This text has something to say about relationships, namely marriage and those kinds of significant relationships. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 to 33. And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church, and the church submits to Christ. So you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this means love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. Here's the topic, the idea that I have that I want to talk about in the video today, marriage and and significant relationships. And on the idea of marriage and significant relationships, there are three thoughts that I have right here, right now in this video to prepare us for a wonderful discussion that we're going to have this Sunday at either 1.30 p.m. for everybody or for six o'clock just for, just for the men. It was really hard to read through some of that text, particularly around the why submitting to the husband because uh, through the years I've heard so much back and forth about how to interpret these texts. And today I get a chance to do a video on it. So three thoughts to prepare us to discuss marriage and those other significant relationships in our lives. First of all, let's start right here. Mutually submit. The text says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Paul the writer of the letter of Ephesians, has his own way of talking about marriage that's a reflection of his own culture that he's writing from. Also, this is the way of coming up with an idea of treating this idea of marriage and significant relationships systematically. Within relationships is a system. It's created where there are roles and where context matters. So before Paul gets into his presentation on marriage and relationships, he starts with two high commands, love God and love others as yourself. And from that foundation to love others as ourselves, we're required to mutually submit to one another and live in harmony. We often see through the New Testament, the command to live in harmony. So whatever it is, we're about to read. The command is to love our neighbor as ourself. And to do that in harmony, we must mutually submit to one another. So who submits to whom? We submit to each other. The man submits to the woman, the woman submits to the man. Mutual submission. But there's more to say because culture also gets a voice. Context truly matters. So here's my second point. Manage power. The text says, for wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Then I'm going to skip and it says, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her. Rather than looking at the two roles separately, 
which may get some people into some hot water like me, I think it's easier to see what's happening as we look at them together. Just, just you know, with fewer words. It's easier to understand. Women submit. Men, crucify yourselves. That's what the text is saying. Women, submit. Men, go off and die. That's the gist of what Paul is offering to us. I find it confusing when I talk to men who want to point out and criticize their wives about not submitting to them somehow, and then they use this passage as a way to kind of beef up their argument, their criticism about telling the wife how she should behave to him. I find it confusing when board members take a stand in church about the place of the wife in the home and the woman in ministry. It's confusing. And they use this text as a foundation for their argument. I don't think they've read the whole passage if they're using this text as a foundation for their directive, their criticism, their truth-telling. If a guy is to fulfill this as equally as a woman is to fulfill this, then the dude has no voice because he's hanging on a cross somewhere about to die. If a guy is to fulfill this as equally as a woman is, then I wouldn't be hearing the guy complaining about the woman not submitting. I wouldn't be hearing anything from him at all. I'd be seeing his wife grieving at his feet while he's been hoisted up and suspended for all to see him taking his last breath. So what's really going on here? Like We can't take this text, this passage, literally. It is meaningless if we try to look at this literally. How do we have a marriage that looks like a guy saying, I do, and then instantly running to a cross to go get crucified and die? Well, that doesn't work. The woman can't submit to a dead guy. The guy can't die if he wants to stay in the marriage. It just doesn't make any sense. The only time it seems to make literal sense is when the guy doesn't look too deeply into what his role is. It's quite easy to make literal sense of the woman's role to submit if the guy doesn't make literal sense of what his role is in the passage as, as a husband. This is a cultural thing, okay? This is where we're going to get some understanding here. This is a cultural thing. In the Greco-Roman world, the context, the culture that this text was written into, men pretty much had all the power. Uh, women were close to own. They weren't owned, but they were close to own, just like the kids were close to being owned. They weren't, but they were close to being owned. Men had the greatest political power in their homes and the greatest earning potential. Women didn't really work like men did. I mean, they did work. They still work. They worked their butts off, but they didn't have the income like men did. They didn't have the political power like men did. In this text, we're looking at what Paul is doing to correct a power imbalance in the culture that he feels just doesn't belong in a home where there are two Jesus followers. Paul, in Galatians, tells us that there's no slave, no free, no Jew, no Greek, no rich, no poor. We are all equal quality, different capacity, but equal in the quality of our humanness. That's, what, that's where Paul brings us in Galatians. How do we mutually submit to one another in a culture where there are so many without power? Well, Paul's idea is very simple. This is what he's presenting us with. The people with the power use their power to place themselves in service to the powerless. And those without power submit themselves to the service. What? Mic drop. That's it. Today, this text, in my opinion, should be read very differently. In many, com in many contexts, women actually have more power than men. In many contexts, it needs to be said that men need to submit to their wives as their wives run to the cross. Now, why am I saying that? Because the principle that Paul is giving us is still true today. Those with the greater power use their power to serve the people without power, in order to fulfill the command to love our neighbors as ourselves and live in mutual submission and harmony. Whichever of you in the relationship has the greater power, that's your cue 
to go to that lower level to raise that other person up. And that could be the man or that could be the woman in our culture. And in our culture, quite often these days, it tends to be the woman. So in your relationship, whichever, who, whichever one of you has a power, in the way and the context that you have more power, use that power to serve your partner, to make him or her better, so that the two of you can stand face to face looking at each other as the equals that you are. Now, there's one more thing that the text has to say, and I'm really looking forward to talk to this. Remember, sign the sex contract. The text says, as the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to talk to his wife, and the two are united into one. Here's the last point that Paul is making about relationships, namely marriage, namely a relationship that includes bum, 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 sex and propagation. And oh man, I wonder if we still get this. Marriage is complex. When you get married to someone, you generally love them. You generally want to commit to them. Love and commitment, that's marriage. No, it's not. I mean, I have deep emotions for my kids, but I'm not married to my kids. I have a commitment to my friend that I've had since I was a teenager. We're not married. I can, I can have deep emotions. And I can have deep commitment, but marriage is not on the table. It's not even an option. Marriage has those things with something else. Marriage is a sex contract. I occasionally have conversations with people who lament that the trend for couples to get married is perceived to be declining. And then I have other conversations saying that they don't feel any reason to get married. I mean, they might say, we're living together, we have a kid, we have a car, we're having sex. Marriage would just complicate things. Tja! Marriage isn't love and commitment. I mean, it's certainly part of that. I would hope that love and commitment is certainly part of that. Marriage is meaningless outside of the propagation part of the relationship. We can all be best friends without getting married. If we want to have sex... That's a bigger deal than we're being led to believe. Sex is being presented as something that's not sacred. It's just fun. It's just whatever. There's no consequence. Well, that's not true. That's not what sex is. Now, I like how Paul summarized the role of sex in marriage by saying, this is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So I say again, each man must love his wife and uh, as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. You heard it here first. Marriage is a sex contract. I mean, I'm not the only one to say it, but I've said it. Don't do the thing if you don't got the ring. Now, you must have heard that before. Sure, there's love and sure, there's commitment that is absolutely included in what marriage is. And there's also propagation. So, IMO. As long as sex is continued to be seen as something that can be shared without a contract, getting married will continue to be seen as irrelevant because marriage is the gateway to sex. Please love your partner as much as you love yourself. Sign that exclusive contract and then risk or even celebrate propagation afterwards. Okay, here's a summary. This text is asking us to behave toward one another in a way that acknowledges and honors the reality that we are all equal in our humanness. We mutually submit to one another. In our relationships, whoever has the power uses their power to serve the other, to raise them up, so that the couple can look at each other eye to eye as equals. And in our relationships, Sex is deeply meaningful and requires a sex contract. The risk and celebration of propagation happens after that contract is signed. And it happens with just that one person you signed that contract with. Okay, that's it from me to you for now. Would you please like? Would you please share? Would you please subscribe? Would you please also ask for the link? We get to talk about this at 1.30 p.m. and 6 o'clock p.m. this Sunday on Zoom. If you want to be part of the conversation, just reach out and ask for the Zoom link. Love to have you. For community, 
creating community spaces so you can connect with others and also with God. I'll see you next time.